Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for being here at uh, nine in the morning. Um, I'm really impressed with all of you. But now we've taken the lights down, so you can go right back to sleep. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> my name's Emily Best. I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark. We're a crowdfunding and distribution platform, and we are a publisher of Bright Ideas Magazine. I am joined by Peter Gerard. I'm uh, director of audience development at Vimeo and a Columbia native. That's awesome. Yeah. Good. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's here for Impressive. Columbia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'm Jody Gottlieb. I am in charge of development and production for Paul Allen's production company, Vulcan Productions. He's a co-founder of Microsoft. Um, you may have heard of that company. Uh, <laughs> so um, I spoke to a few of you ahead of time. I think m most of you are students, right? Can I see a show of hands, students in the room? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make an assumption that um, you probably haven't had a, uh, a broad and deep education in what distribution even is. So just to make this conversation valuable to start, um, Jody, would you do the honors of just kind of a top level, Sure. what is film distribution? What counts as film distribution? And then we'll go from there. Sure. It's, I'll sum it up by saying it's actually everything that happens after you finish your film. And you start the process uh, of finding distribution partners, which is the outlet to which you um, get your film or digital or whatever it is you're, you're producing out into the marketplace. <clears throat> it's essentially where a lot of people try to monetize their film and get eyeballs. So you want to, uh, many, there are many, many, many different channels of distribution. Um, most often it's through, for feature docs, it's through uh, film festival, and then there could be a broadcast partner, and then there's a whole foray into international distribution. So it's really where you... One second. Broadcast partner, that goes to television. Yep, sorry. Yep. yep. Uh, I'm going to get real granular. I hope it's not annoying to you guys, but we can, we, I know that we are going to get into in-speak that's going to involve acronyms and words that you're not going to know and then you're going to feel like you can't ask because we sound like we know what we're talking about, but actually and we, we just don't. look like jerks. So and we don't. I just, so just yeah. please feel free yeah, to Yeah, I want to make sure that you guys questions. understand all, all the things that we're talking about. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Uh, and so um, broadcast partners, so can happen before before or after you pick up your festival release. Um, there are, there's no way of doing, one way of doing this business. Everybody has a different approach and different methodology. I come to it from a, we are a production company, so we're a distribution partner along with a co-production partner. So we help you find your way um, based on our relationships, but also most importantly, for me, as a filmmaker, it's about finding the right vehicle that's right for your project. So, um, you know, everybody comes to it with their own experience and their own business agenda. Uh, I come from it. My approach is often what's right for the project, um, which <clears throat> I'm proud of. And then something I uh, stress with within my organization and also to filmmakers, and that's part of the appeal of working with someone like us. So all of the channels of distribution that are available out there, let's start with the one that we all know, and that's festivals. We know that because we're all here at one, right? And then there's theatrical distribution, right? What's playing at your local art house or what's playing at your local megaplex? Um, after that is uh, now transactional VOD and television VOD. So your cable provider has a, a video on demand, you know, pay-per-view, all of those things. And then you have transactional VOD uh, online, which is Vimeo does transactional VOD, Seed and Spark does transactional VOD, iTunes uh, is probably the biggest. Um, there, are, there are several of those places that you can pay money up front, like $2.99, to rent or own a, a movie, right? Um, and then after that, there's um, ad-supported VOD, like Hulu. Does anybody watch Hulu sometimes? Those ads are there so that the filmmakers get paid. I know they're really annoying to you, but they pay a lot of money to filmmakers, so just grin and bear it and be like, this, at least the filmmakers are making money. Small money, small money. Yeah, but money. Um, Maybe nine cents. De depends on your deal. 
depends on your distribution deal. Anyway, this is the point. Uh, and then there's uh, subscription VOD like Netflix, right? Um, so those are a range of options. And then, of course, you can distribute for free online in places like YouTube and a million other places. Um, and airlines, too. You can sell your, sell your film to airlines. Um, television broadcast, that's an important one. Educational is another piece, and non-theatrical, um, so that can be community screenings. And, yes? And, and I just what add I a, lot, <clears throat> a lot of that times that's rolled up to educational component. Right. For us, we roll community relations and screening into our educational objectives. Have we missed any? <clears throat> That's a pretty good overview. So yeah, so it's basically like if you were going to divide it up into categories, you sort of you have theaters, you have cable VOD, you have online retailers. That's Amazon, Google Play, Vimeo, Seed and Spark, <coughs> iTunes, all of us online where you can buy movies, and then you have uh, TV and you have educational. And I'm really glad that Brian is walking in right now because he's the one who needs to talk educational in the first place. Um, so those are all the things that you can do. And the problem with all of those outlets is that they're not all good for every film. And they, um, you can reach them in about a million different ways. There, there are tons and tons of companies that put together different packages and different combinations of how you reach your distribution. And we represent four of them, um, but we're only four of a lot. 10,000. Yeah. 20,000. Something. Like a, a large number of companies. So um, I think the question that the panel is really asking uh, today is there's this model of distribution that we're all kind of familiar with, which is like a movie ends up in the theater near you, and then after that it ends up maybe on iTunes or on your cable VOD, and then it goes other places. And in the meantime, um, <clears throat> the film, is the filmmaker making any money? Right? Because actually, what does any of distribution matter? Distribution basically, I don't even know why we didn't say this. Distribution sort of represents when people watch your movie, and it can be free, and it can be paid. Right? And what we're here to talk about, because I believe the panel is called Dollars and Donuts, is the part where audiences exchange money for your film, and then who gets to keep it, and how, and how can we do it better? Um, so, hi, Brian. Hey. Who are you? I'm Brian. <laughs> and where do you work, Brian? I work at a place called Tug. And what is Tug, Brian? Tug is a, started as a crowdsourced distribution model for filmmakers to get their films in theaters. And since then, we've expanded to, you know, pretty much any screening is a community event. So that includes, you know, 90% of the theaters in the U.S., as well as universities, churches, bars, community centers, baseball stadiums, um, to really galvanize communities and allow filmmakers to bring their audience into the distribution model. Great. OK, so we have a production company who sort of helps put together these strategic distribution models. We have a, um, an open source theatrical um, platform that can get you onto sort of any screen anywhere, right? That's really based around building your audience. Um, how, would, how do you describe Vimeo in this landscape? Vimeo is the largest open platform for any filmmaker who wants to sell a film online. Um, you just upload your movie, set your price, tell your audience that it's there, and you're um, actually transacting within minutes. And it's, we have a huge audience and a great global reach so it's a, it's a useful place in that chain that we were talking about. Um, and Seed and Spark helps you build your audience through crowdfunding and then monetize it through distribution. So um, we just actually announced yesterday that through a successful crowdfunding campaign on Seed and Spark, you can qualify for theatrical distribution with emerging pictures, um, be online cable VOD to about 6 million uh, customers, and then get your film to uh, iTunes, Hulu, Amazon, Google Play, Vudu. I never remember all of them. Netflix, something else. Uh, so, um, so what we have actually represented here is a lot of <clears throat> options, which is really exciting. So I would like to start out um, by asking you, because I think it's helpful for this crowd, what are the problems that our respective companies <clears throat> are trying to solve? 
You're starting with me. Okay. I have a totally, I live in a different universe in that um, uh, there's something in my universe, <clears throat> I have not coined this phrase, called a BHAG. They're big, hairy, audacious goals. Um, so within that, there's an expectation that we, as an organization, are going to stop these small things like global warming, uh, <laughs> oceans acidification, um, overpopulation, uh, environmental hazards, conservation decline um, in five years. So, sure. So we... we <clears throat> through movies. Uh, through movies, through films, through digital projects, through social impact campaigns. So we put the stake in the ground where the rubber meets the road, getting people to either change policy, change minds, change behaviors, whatever it is, <clears throat> there's an expectation uh, that we have these moonshots that we have to accomplish. So for us, and because we live in a very unique space that it's really about making a difference um, and getting people educated and informed, for us, our distribution model is completely unique. Um, and it's all driven by the content. So we distributed a film, we're in the process of distributing a film called Racing Extinction that premiered, <clears throat> excuse me, at Sundance. And so really we look at what's the best way to do that. Who are the right partners with the right alignment in order to get it out there? So it's important <clears throat> to pause here and say your distribution is utterly mission driven. You have a goal with what you want to do with each film and you tailor a distribution plan to that goal. Yeah. This is a really important point because this is something that filmmakers miss mm -hmm. is thinking about what do I want to do with this film? And the answer isn't always become famous or make a million dollars. Sometimes the answer is change policy or uh, change minds. Um, and, and that can really change the way that you put together your distribution and who you partner with. And this is just sort of a bullet point here that's emerging. So our, our approach is a front end approach. We oftentimes, I'll take this from a filmmaker standpoint. When you're in a film, you're knee deep in alligators, right? You're passionate, you're engaged, you're producing the film. It's all about the content, your characters, the story. You're like in it all the way up to your eyeballs. And oftentimes what happens with filmmakers is they don't have the bandwidth and, and the maybe uh, business sense to, to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish on the front end. Because for someone like me and my organization, we help connect those dots, but oftentimes um, filmmakers don't think about it until the end. You know, it's the whole objective. We have to get it to the festivals. But I'm here to say there's a ton of different opportunities out there. It's really about understanding and how to leverage your content. You know it. You know what you want to do. You have to find people who want to help you exploit that. So sometimes it's not you know, the, the festival route. Sometimes I just wrapped out uh, 20 short films on the economy where we had the luxury of distributing these for free. It was a substantial project with big name Hollywood directors for free through uh, 62 distribution partners. Never had happened, of which one was uh, Vimeo. And we said, you can take this content for free, but you have to put it in front of your paywall. Now, obviously, as an independent filmmaker, you would never say, here, take my film for free, unless it was you had grant funding and other things. So. It's really about, for me, I was like, how do we get this out there so that the most people are going to see it? And what was our mission? To edu educate and inform the public. And so this is, we created a really incredibly unique distribution model that was specific to this project. So everybody, you know, every distributor has their own agenda and the way they do business. Um, we're sort of a hybrid where we want to work with you to figure out what's the best way to leverage your project. Great. Um, <clears throat> Brian, can you talk a little bit about the problems that you guys are solving in distribution and the way it benefits the filmmaker's bottom line? Yeah. Uh, so we, we basically go through a similar thing where we every film that we speak with or every film that comes to us, we kind of go through the same exercise where it's, you know, what are your goals? And it's kind of one of usually three things, right? Where it's either we want to make the most money possible or we want to change the world or we want the most amount of people to see our film. And you know, those don't always overlap, 
they can, but they don't. And so, you know, the, the biggest challenge, I think, is that there's sometimes a, you know, a thought that as a filmmaker, there's, you made the film and you're kind of done, right? And there's a lot of work that goes into distribution, no matter where you end up, right? So if you get picked up by a, you know, a trendy film distri distributor, you know, traditional, then there's still work involved. If you're going the DI... He's here. He's here. He found I it. I made it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Sorry They're coming. That. Thanks, Siri. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is just the the idea that there there is work that has to be done, and oftentimes it doesn't have to be done by the filmmaker, but it's most productive when it is, because you made the content, you understand your audience better than probably anyone, and when you bring in work, it's important to bring in people that also understand your audience, right? So that, you know, the, the whole idea of, right now it's a, a trendy topic, right, is impact producers. You know, the, it's a, those are great, great assets and resources for your film and for your distribution and grassroots campaign, but also, you know, there's, there's an important need to understand your audience base. And so when you are looking down those roads and, you know, really, you know, the outreach coordination, it's important that they also understand your audience, right? because one film audience space doesn't always transition to another, so one success story doesn't always transition to another. So it's really important to understand that and to really look at that, and then also being realistic. When you're approaching distribution, no matter what platform, what medium, whether it's digital, theatrical, educational, <clears throat> it's really you know setting yourself up, looking at you know, who, you, again, who your audience is, what the outlets are for that distribution and understanding, you know, really where the impact's going to be and focusing your effort there. Because when you go in with, you know, an overambitious mind or you set really lofty goals, what ends up happening is you chase, you know, a lot of things that aren't, aren't ever gonna come to fruition. So can we, let's talk about the most common one of those, because I feel like that is, a, is also a helpful background. Um, for years, as independent filmmakers, our pipeline to distribution has been, you make a film, you go to a major festival, of which in North America there are really like three or four sales markets, uh, Sundance, South by a little bit, Tribeca a little bit, Toronto definitely, but that's for really big films. That's, that's kind of where you can sell your films in, in North America. That's where the distributors are showing up to buy stuff. Now, 15,000 independent films made, feature length independent films made in the US every year. A hundred of them get into Sundance. About, so Sundance will tell you that 90% of those films get distribution and the Sundance Institute people themselves will say most of those filmmakers would have been better off distributing themselves. Yeah. Why? When you get picked up by a major distributor, <clears throat> they purchase usually all rights, sometimes all rights, all territories, and what that means is their rights to sell now your, uh, your theatrical, your broadcast, all those channels that we talked about. That would be an all rights deal. Some filmmakers carve up their rights. Say, they say, you can, take your, um, you can take our theatrical and our cable VOD and we're gonna keep our digital rights, right? We're gonna keep our right to stream on Vimeo or on Seed and Spark. Or um, you might carve out your theatrical to do a tug campaign and then let a distributor take care of the digital side because that can be a kind of a pain in the ass, right? So um, you, you make a deal, um, um, you sell some amount of rights in some amount of territories. Maybe it's North America. Maybe it's the whole world. Um, Netflix, for example, buys a lot of documentaries, all rights, all territories. And then you have to deliver that film to your distributor. And uh, I think some friends of mine who did an all rights, all territories deal with Netflix, the deliverables package cost them $120,000 in order to deliver their film to Netflix. Um, Netflix is not like, we'll pay your deliverables. They're like, Call us back when you have this list of things done. Um, <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then that amount of money, whatever that sale price is, usually goes to making the investors in the film whole, paying them back. Maybe paying called, them back. Called the waterfall. Yes. So um, what happens when you sell your film is your investors get paid back first, plus whatever percentage you promise them. Most deals are like your investment plus 10% or your investment plus 20% before anyone else sees a dime. But then what happens? Uh, it goes through a sales agent, who is the person who at the festival is brokering these deals for you. Um, 
and they sell it to a distributor, and the distributor packages it for uh, the exhibitors and markets it to an audience, right? And that marketing is a cost to them, which they have to recoup before you see any money. So the exhibitor sells the film to your audience and takes a cut. Then the distributor recoups all of their expenses and then takes a cut. And then the sales agent takes their cut. And how much money do you think is left for the filmmaker at the end of that? A few dollars and a donut? Yes. 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 Good. We have to leave now. You just brought it all back to this. We have to go. We're done. The panel's over. We got to dollars and donuts faster than we meant to. So, um, so the filmmaker ends up, if they're lucky, with a few dollars and a donut. And uh, uh, that was so. I'm so pleased with that joke. But a God. lot of eyeballs. Um, sometimes, sometimes a lot of sometimes a sometimes. lot of people have seen it. But two things. One, that the, that is an audience that your distributor owns, not you right? Yeah. So you don't have the benefit of taking that audience with you to your next project unless you're working with that distributor again. Um, and... Uh, the distributor won't have that audience. The distri no. yeah, they're not really collecting that the stuff re either. The retailers, the only ones who have a relationship with your customers. Right. So... Um, so I think it's really important to understand that one of the problems that we're trying to address is that even in the best case scenario, even in the scenario where you make one of the hundred, I mean, not even because that's international competition, one of the 20 best uh, independent films all year, because 20 is about how many six to seven figure deals are made mm -hmm. a year. Um, you make one of the 20 best independent films a year. You go to one of the top North American film festivals. You sell to one of the top distributors. You're now in the point zero zero four percent of all films made every year even in that case you might not make any money you guys what the fuck <laughs> so so this is why there's been a proliferation of these platforms right but that is the, that is the more extreme version <laughs> of the of the scale absolutely but it's one that there is an entire you wouldn't exist if that problem weren't there do you know what I mean? Like, part of the um, reason is we don't have a direct connection to our audience because that pipeline that I just described is independent film distribution and it is utterly not independent. Right, but there's other, like, so what you're talking about is the six to seven figure deal category. Right. And there's a whole range of other categories that typically apply to most documentaries. Absolutely. This, but this is what's important is that the dream that everybody is chasing the, the sort of yes. like pie in the sky scenario is one in which you don't keep your audience and you don't usually make any money. So let's not chase that pie in the sky. Let's talk about what are these other things that you can do that might put dollars in your pocket. Now you can have the segue. Go. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the reason I'm in this actually is probably more because I showed a film here in 2006 and had a distribution deal out of the True False Festival. And I was like, great, I've got a distributor. And they never sold it to anyone. So they took your rights. They took my rights. And they didn't do anything with them. They didn't it. do anything with them. Um, they only had North America, which was fortunate, because I was going and selling it to television companies around the world. Um, Why is that even legal? I don't know. Yeah, I, guys. Because you get a contract in front of you as a, as a new filmmaker. You're like, I have a contract. That's exciting. And you sign it. You don't read it. You don't think about it. You just sign it. Don't ever do that. I've done it. It's a bad idea. <laughs> um, but there, there's, there are good middlemen. I mean, we refer to distributors and sales agents and retailers as middlemen who are helping you get your product, your film, out to your fans, your audience, your customers. Um, and there are some that are good. And I think the important thing is to do your research because as a filmmaker, unless you, you have you know, the backing that, like, say, Vulcan has, you guys have a fantastic operation going on. Most production companies yep. don't have those kinds of resources, and they don't have the team that is necessary to really go out and mobilize and find customers. So working with distributors who are smart and savvy and will cut you in when you're making effort is something that I think is really key going forward in the future. I think there is the sort of, there's the extreme of the all rights deal at Sundance, which happens to a handful of people, and even smaller number of people when you're talking about documentaries. And then there's the other extreme of total self-distribution, go straight to Vimeo On Demand, and try and get people to come and pay $3 for your movie that they've never heard of, and they've never heard of you. In between, finding a distributor that actually does marketing, 
Not all distributors do that marketing you're talking about. Actually, it's very few distributors that actually market a film. And then working with them. And I think the ideal scenario in 2015 and probably for the next few years is where you have a great distributor who does great marketing, who works very closely with the filmmaker, who's also promoting the film, working with their fans, driving people to one place where they're coming to purchase the movie and talk about the movie and share it wider, and then working with a, a great retailer. I mean, at, at Vimeo, and when we have those kinds of partnerships going, we put dollars and hard work behind a film and to help support someone's career. So when you have that kind of like three-way partnership, then everybody wins. And some distributors even will measure what, which sales are coming in because of the work the filmmaker is doing and give them a higher percentage. So they're getting some money before the recruitment even takes place because they're putting the effort in. And that's the ideal <coughs> scenario that I really strive for. So this is a really important moment, sort of a second bullet point moment, which is you are part of the distribution equation. You're going to do some of the strategy. You're going to do uh, a lot of the audience building. And you're definitely going to do some of the marketing and promotional work for the rest of your career. If you want to have a sustainable career as a filmmaker, you have to be engaged in the marketing and distribution process. Um, it's the, like dating, right? The prettiest girl or guy in the room isn't always the best distributor. So educate yourselves, inform, hold out a little bit. Um, <laughs> Wait, are we talking about dating or? But I'm saying both. Um, you know, it's really about... you got to swipe left a lot. Yes. <laughs> Go left. Um, you do. Thank you for that. That was a Tinder that. joke, right? Yes. Okay. I'm old and I got it. Um, no, but it really is, it really is, look, if you protect your asset and your film or digital project or whatever it is, you have to go into it understanding what your ultimate objective is. If you think that you are going to distribute your film and make $3 million, God bless you, I love your idealism, but at the end of the day, it's really important to, to do the strategic work, to talk to as many people as you can, to understand what is the best method for your project. Well, let's, okay, so this is, a, this is an important point to stop and say, let's say I'm a filmmaker, and I'm about, which I am, and I'm about to make my next movie, which I am. Uh, what I'm thinking about in the development stage, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this, in today, in 2015, in order to start even thinking about putting a package together that an investor might look at, is I'm thinking about who is my audience, where are they, and how do I find them? Yeah, right? How do I get their email addresses? How do I get to be able to talk to them directly? It's a very, very simple place to start, but um, it's, a, it's a very, very important set of questions to ask yourself as a filmmaker because from where I am in the development process, I have a completed script and I'm starting to think about what the next steps are until it lands in Brian's lap for tug screenings or at Vimeo or on Seed and Spark or hopefully, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing a social impact documentary, but with a, with a production company that also has some resources to bring to bear. What I need to bring to all of them is an ability to demonstrate that there's an audience for this film. And that can't be theoretical. We used to be able to do this theoretically. Now we have to do it with what the tech industry has taught us to call traction. We have to be able to demonstrate that there is an audience for this film because there's a Twitter following, because there's a mailing list, because there's a Facebook group, because there's a uh, Tumblr blog with a lot of followers, these sorts of things. So my really good friend Jonah Markowitz made a film called Shelter in 2007. It has every year subsequent been either number one or two as the best gay film of all time, right? And he's had a really hard time making his second feature. And, but the landscape has totally changed since 2007. This was before the Vimeos of the universe and the tugs where you could reach your audience directly on your terms. Um, and so now he's going back to the, I would discover, because I was like, do this research and see what happens millions of fans online that have been keeping the torch alive for him to make his next movie. Millions of views on YouTube videos, YouTube clips that have been pirated and put online. Millions of hits in chat rooms. 
you guys, there's still chat rooms about <laughs> this film and how important it was to people. Um, there are fan pages in like 13 languages for this film. That is what we call demonstrable evidence that there is an audience for his next film. Does that make sense? We, we do a lot of what's, what we refer to is landscape analysis, um, where we survey, uh, I take hundreds of pitches a year. I also have an internal development team. But, um, so if there's something that I'm interested in, and we don't just do social impact work. There was a little film uh, that I became enamored with that had absolutely nothing to do with anything we do. Um, and I, I said, we have to do it. It has a cult following, it has whatever. So, um, but we do these landscape analysis where we, we take a look at, in media, what projects are out there in this particular space, understand who that audience is that was attracted to that film, and really dig deep to use that as a case study for, is this the right project that could be similar? And, and it helps us really hone our approach, both in in distribution and also marketing and what we uh, essentially want to uh, want to do. And so I would encourage you as a filmmaker, do that. It's, you know, the interwebs is a fantastic place <coughs> to sort of see, um, do case studies, take a look at films that have not necessarily been, you know, the at the top of their game where they've had all the success. Those films that interest you, that are similar, and take a look at some of the distribution models that have come out of that and, and learn what their what their audience is because there's no one way to do this, right? There's a groundswell in, in social that um, maybe that's the way to do it. So I think it's about getting creative and thinking a little outside the box and I hate that term, sorry. Um, it's, it's, that term is now inside the uh, Inside. Think way inside. Um, so just really quickly, does, do any of the film students in here have a film that you're working on right now that you would be willing to talk to us very briefly about? Anyone? Do it, yes. Go. Hi. T can you just tell us your name and kind of like a short synopsis of the film you're working on? Uh, hi, my name's Savannah Rogers, and my short film is about a group of writers that are trying so hard to be politically correct that it impedes their writing process. Awesome. So uh, Savannah's making a short film about a group of writers trying so hard to be politically correct they can't get anything done. Who'd be interested in watching this movie? J school guys? Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. Savannah, what I recommend you do is go to all of those people who just raised their hand, because that's your coming audience, and say, where, uh, find out where they hang out online, where they get their news, what kind of blogs they read. Uh, Stalk and, them. And, <laughs> and we call it research. We call it research. It stalking. And, one, awesome. one of, and the most important thing is where do you watch what you watch? And if you find out that like all of them say, I stream on my laptop in bed at the end of the day, right? Then you don't have to worry about, for example, shooting your film in 6K raw, right? Because it's just going to end up a computer screen size. Right, um, and and if they all say, you know what, I really prefer to watch things in a theater. Well, before you're even done uh, with your film, you should be talking to Brian over here to figure out how do we make a strategy to get this in theaters so that the people who've said that they want to see it can mobilize and see it. So, Brian, can you give us a sense? I mean, let's do this like for like eight more minutes, and then we'll go to questions. Can you give us a sense of like? What are filmmakers who are having a lot of success with Tug doing? What are they doing right? Yeah, so the, a recent example is a film called Touch the Wall, which I don't, how, how many people have heard of that film? Greta, Greta has people, heard of that couple film. Couple people. I feel like so, I'm not making that up. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's a film about Missy Franklin, who's uh, Olympic gold medalist swimmer. Uh, I, I believe the youngest gold medalist ever um, at like 14. But the, the film is very specific in that it's about you know, her and it's about swimming and it's mostly targeted to young women. And the filmmaker, Christo, has been basically cold calling swim clubs and swim organizations and swim teams for the past year. And what that means is that for six months before the film even premiered, he was talking to them and saying, hey, I, I want you guys to be interested in this. Are you interested? 
And when they said yes, he started to talk to them about how they could help support the film. And so sometimes it's just, hey, I'm going to send you a link for a 20-minute clip. Can you share that with the team and get them excited? And once it comes closer to distribution, it's, hey, can you show my film? Can you get people into a theater, watch it, and turn it into a community screening? And so through that, you know, we've had, I think at this point, over 350 screenings um, largely hosted by swim clubs. And what they're doing is not just going and seeing a film at their local AMC or Regal Theater, but they're also fundraising. And they're doing a Q&A afterwards or an introduction, or they're using it to give out their awards for the swim season, you know, so that five minutes before the screening starts, there's a five minute award program. And so it becomes much more than just the film itself. Um, it's, a, it's truly an event and it's truly involving the respective communities. But what's also happening is that Christo is learning who those people are. And you know, through uh, our tools, we're capturing that data and Christo can go on and log into his dashboard and actually see who's buying tickets, see who's hosting screenings, and see who's following his film. And through that, he's getting a really deep understanding, right? Because the difference between a Facebook like and someone who purchases a ticket to go see your film in a movie theater is, it's huge. Because those people are, you know, call it your super fan. And if you get a million Facebook likes, that's cool. But, but if it you only have, proves you're good at getting Facebook likes. Right, and they're, they could be bots or something. But if you have 5,000 people, just 5,000 people that buy a ticket to see your film in theaters, those people are very dedicated to your film. So that when your film is on Vimeo and you have a direct-to-consumer method, email all of those people with a link to purchase the film or a discount code to purchase the film or a way to share the film, and they're going to do it. Uh, we've, we've done campaigns through... Uh, you know, MailChimp and other services where we've sent out things just like that. And to give you an example, this is a completely different film, but Knights of Badassdom, um, if anyone's heard of that, is a film where we, we did the same thing and we worked with Best Buy to give everyone a Blu-ray discount. And we had a 68% open rate, um, which is like absurd. It's absurd. And it was a, like a 7% click-through rate, which means that those people, 7% of the people that we emailed actually went through to the checkout page. Um, and you know, it just shows that the, the people that are willing to go and see your film in theaters, and especially through kind of the grassroots crowdsource campaign that Tug offers is, you know, you're super fans in the same way that the people that back your Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or Seed and Spark campaign. Yeah, we did the same with uh, Culture High. Mm -hmm. It was touring with Tug. It was a film about uh, marijuana legalization. And the uh, filmmaker had done these tug screenings. We supplied them with discount codes so that they could promote discounts to their people who had attended those screenings. Um, we still got to get to the point where we can hit the people who didn't get to go to a screening. Right. So we've got to talk about that later. <clears throat> um, OK, so um, we kind of wanted to give you a sense of like, what is distribution? What are all your options? What are some of the problems? What are filmmakers who are succeeding doing it on their own doing? And um, the bullet points that we've covered so far are you want to have a strategy early on, and that strategy is determined by what do I want to do with this film, right? You want to know who your audience is early on and start a relationship with them, no matter what. No matter whether you want to go to a traditional distributor or you want to do a tug campaign and have your film land on one of the, uh, the online retail outlets. Um, and, uh, and then you're going to stick with it all the way through because nobody will sell your film like you can. Um, let's open it up to questions for the last 18 minutes that we have here. I know that it's still super early and it's dark in there and I'm surprised you guys are still awake, um, except that we've been so compelling. Um, <clears throat> does anybody have a question to start? Oh, come on. Film students, really? Nothing, nothing to learn. We're good, <laughs> you got it all. I saw a hand, I saw a hand. Yes. Um, so if we wanted to focus on or start with localized or regional distribution, would uh, digital proliferation be better or traditional distribution? Are there pros and cons to both or is that even a sustainable option? I think that starting with a local regional distribution makes a lot of sense, but I would start in 
uh, you know, the physical rather than the digital because yeah. you're, you want to have screenings where you're meeting people. And I think uh, one of the things we haven't really addressed properly today is that what you're looking at with what you're doing as a filmmaker, especially as people who are starting out as film students, you're looking at your career. You're looking at the entire like, rest of your life. So that audience you're building for each film is some people that you want to have with you for the rest of your life. You want them to see every single film you make so that you can actually make more films. And if you are starting with a film that has a lot of local, regional re relevance, that's a really great opportunity because you're going to meet people in person who are really interested in the work that you make. And you start to kind of have yourself as a brand representing your work. And you can do screening tours, you can do talks, you can do lots of different things that are much more expensive and much more difficult when you try and do them uh, internationally. Um, digital, great, do it later, but when you've got that opportunity to like work with a local regional audience, I'd say do it on the ground with yeah. your feet and maybe with the help of something like Tug. Yeah, and build relationships with your local cinemas. I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing and important relationship for filmmakers in their communities to build. Um, because your local cinema has been interacting with the local audience for a long time, and they know a lot, of, uh, they know a lot about them. One thing I just want to say is um, the distance between a Facebook like and somebody showing up to your screening is a, gr is a, is a vast distance. And it all comes down to... What is it that you want people to do? You want people to watch your film. And you might want them to watch it online, you might want them to show up, but um, it takes a lot to get someone from the ether, meaning everyone you don't know, into the center, which is the people who now are your core audience. And they have to go through some concentric circles, right? And the, the, that first concentric circle in the digital space might be they go from not knowing about you to liking your Facebook page or um, following you on Twitter or something like that. And that's good, but it's algorithm-based, or it's timing-based, it's feed-based. It's not a very reliable connection, because you post something on Facebook, and God knows who Facebook shows it to, right? They show it to like 6% of the people who actually like your page. Um, on Twitter, if they don't look at the right time or scroll far enough down, they may never see your tweet, for example, um, which is why the next phase into these concentric circles is the email addresses. It's why they're so much more important. Because when you email someone and they're expecting your email and they're excited about your email, they open it and they click all the way through. They're starting to do what you ask because they're developing a relationship with you. They're no longer out in the ether. They've probably come in through social media or word of mouth and now you have their email address and you can get right into their pocket, right? 90% of US mobile customers have smartphones which means pretty much everybody who is available digitally is available digitally on their person at all times, right? But nowadays you want their phone numbers too. Right, so because was, I'm getting there. Oh, right, getting sorry. There. No, so then you come in the next uh, phase, right, which is you start to develop a more personal relationship with your audience because from email, people are going to start to show up and do what you ask. And once you have that person-to-person -person contact, then you can really start getting more and more important information. Um, you can start at a screening like this, like we have a text to join um, our mailing list and you can either join via, so that you receive text messages from us or you can join to get um, uh, emails from us, right? So I come to something like this and I'm like text spark to 44144 and you can pull out your phone and then all of a sudden you're on our mailing list. And that's because we've had a real interaction and you trust me enough with the next level of information. Does that make sense? And you have a much bigger open rate from yeah. text message, and you can also get more geographically specific. So when you're talking about this a regional campaign, um, texting, I mean, Kevin Smith on his film Red State used this really, really well, where he had lots of people on his sort of text message list, and whenever there was a, an event happening in a particular city, all these people in the region would get text messages, and they'd get mobilized it's probably closer to 100% of an open rate on text message. So if people are willing to give you that, do it. Yeah, that's, so there are tools that it's really important to have for any sort of mobilization campaign, regional or otherwise, right? You wanna learn about how to use mailing list functions like MailChimp. You wanna learn to use the, the text to join plugins. You wanna learn to interface with your audience in lots of different ways. Get good at, so Savannah, right? Um, if all of these people over here said, actually, I'm mostly on Facebook and a little bit on Twitter, and then I'm on Snapchat. I'm just making an assumption about your ages, sorry. Um, 
you might want to figure out what your outreach campaign is via Snapchat because it turns out like a lot of your audience is hanging out on Snapchat. If, you, if they all say Facebook, right, then you're gonna wanna concentrate on your outreach on Facebook. But these are sorts of things that you know, you start to learn by identifying your audience and that can be like five people to start <laughs> and learning more about them and then trying to find five more like them. Right? Because as Peter said, very importantly, this isn't about the life cycle of one film. This is a life cycle of your relationship with your audience for an entire career. We, we actually, t <laughs> we just released this, uh, these films, as I was mentioning, digitally. And um, we had 15 years of emails and contacts and uh, relationships that we've built. Um, that was our initial draw. So... I have a very heady goal of, of reaching 30 million views uh, by the end of this year. I'm at about 16 million. Um, so I'm in a, a get my shit together um, for the next six months and try to drive views uh, to this 30 million. And so part of that is um, leveraging our existing relationships to drive viewership and eyeballs. So... Yes. Super important to remember that. I'm coming. She knows the deal. <laughs> <laughs> She's a panel veteran. Yes, I am. Well, as I said yesterday, I just want to say thank you for all this amazing information. It's so, so valuable <coughs> to the students. Um, but I'm just wondering in terms of this sort of DIY model, if I could just call it that for now, in terms of the filmmaker really inserting themselves. How much money are we talking about for outlay? I mean, I think that's a concern. Or maybe I'm not, that's not accurate. Could you talk a little bit about the economics of doing this on your own? Sure. So the unfortunate answer to that is it totally depends, right? Um, there's a lot of it, a lot of this that you do with your own elbow grease. So that's, that has a human capital cost. You need to put in a lot of hours, right, in order to build, you know, do this audience research and reach out online and do your message testing and figure out what people like and... <laughs> and constantly give them reasons to join your mail, mailing list or trust you enough to join your you know, text notification list, um, that, that piece of it is human capital cost, right? Um, marketing campaigns, it depends on how targeted they are, what regions you're reaching into, um, how many people you're trying to reach and in what way. Um, Facebook ad campaigns can be very successful for $250 or they can utterly fail for $250, right? So um, it's it, some of it has to do with making sure you're amassing kind of the right partners and expertise on each of these fronts. But part of this audience research should help you build the team that will help you best succeed. So if it turns out that all your people are hanging out on Facebook, you probably want to engage with somebody who really knows how to build community on Facebook. That could be another filmmaker who's done it really well. You could try to get a hold of Leah Meyerhoff from Film Fatales, whose last film, um, whose, whose uh, most recent film, I believe in Unicorns, has 120,000 Facebook followers, which she has done utterly organically through community screenings and festivals, right? So re this is part of, like, who do I need to call to see what they did? That piece, I think, is really important. Building the team of expertise can actually be taking that time to really do that part thoughtfully, I think, can save you the most physical dollars. But in terms of, do you mean, like, hard deliverables costs? Um, just in terms of, like, this, I know it would be a lot of time, but I wonder if there's just, like, Tug, for example, <clears throat> what's the economics of working with Tug? Like, everybody's going to mm -hmm. cost a little bit. Yeah, uh, so you can you can go on to what we call Tug School, and it actually has like a visual breakdown of the financial model. But the economics are meant to work that every screening exists as its, as its own unit, so that every screening that happens, the filmmaker is earning money. And the you know while there's a lot of you know elbow grease going into each screening, there's no upfront cost. There's no fees associated, right? We handle all of the logistics and the shipping and the replicating of the DCPs um, to make sure- That's a digital sure, cinema print. To make sure that the, the filmmaker isn't having to think about those costs for each screening. Um, so as you start to magnify that you know, across hundreds of screenings, it becomes really meaningful revenue for the filmmaker. And especially you know, when you look at what a lot of traditional theatrical releases earn, and then you look at what the film team actually gets from that, 
they could make a million dollars and they could see zero dollars of that. Um, and so the way the economics are meant to work is that everyone involved is making money. And so no, either no one makes money or everyone makes money. And in addition to that, I think what's really important, um, and she was mentioning this, is the social capital involved. Because we collect the information of everyone who's buying a ticket, that, that becomes your information. You know, you're, you're, you own that audience base. And so that, you know, it becomes a very meaningful thing. And especially because that theatrical experience and the way, you know, th these screenings work through word of mouth, people are talking about the film before it even shows. And then people see the film and they're talking about it. And for however long that tale is, there's a lot of buzz and word of mouth going on. And that's what really helps build and identify your audience so that when you put it up on Vimeo, there's, <clears throat> there's a really meaningful spark. way to capitalize. I am also a distributor, just by the way. That's right, that's right. Or iTunes or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. But the point being that the, there's, there's kind of a, 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 an opportunity to create a lot of interest and buzz in, as he mentioned earlier, the physical experience and turn that into a, a way to actually see revenue from that um, downstream. And uh, Tug, Tug is the first, and Tug's platform is the first time in existence that a theatrical screening is guaranteed to be profitable for the filmmaker. That model has never existed before. Like it's a, it, it is a huge, huge disruptive revelation to our business, um, which is one of the things that's so incredibly exciting about it because every screening, as I understand it, guarantees some revenue to the filmmaker. And that's never been true before. Exactly. Right. That's right. Like, you better, you know, well, this is about building your audience from the ground up. So you're not just creating a film. You know, that's it's really about that experience and really leveraging your relationships. Um, Lee Hirsch, who directed uh, Bully. I bet you guys were involved with that mm -hmm. a little bit. He has done. He would be so happy. I'm talking about him this morning. Um, <laughs> He has done an amazing job. Obviously, that is a social current issue that is impacting and permeating everyone. Um, but he has done an amazing job of building from nothing, really, um, through his uh, low-tech hustle, is what I, what I refer to it as, building an audience along the way while producing the film. He gives blood at the office every day. Um, his film was out maybe two years ago, I think, um, and he still is working so hard to get the mission of his film out, and, and there's a whole social impact thing he's trying to educate uh, and raise awareness and stop bullying, and so um, it really is about taking it all the way through from even before you start a project, when you start conceiving it and thinking about what the ultimate finish line looks like for you is super important. It's your work has just begun when you start making the film and it goes on well after you've completed the film and you are your own best advocate. So get out there, understand the people, talk to people, network. You know, you don't just have to go to festivals, talk to other filmmakers. I, I can assure you there are plenty of filmmakers who would love to share their experience. Um, alumni are a great place to start as students to sort of tap into understanding what your ultimate uh, end game is and what you want to accomplish with your project. But back to your original question on what does all this cost, um, it does cost money. And um, I, I think that the people are able to raise money to make a film. They should try and raise at least as much money, if possible, to market and distribute that film. And that's what the studios do. You see millions of posters and trailers and TV ads and everything else, and they've maybe spent $150 million on that film. They're probably spending $150, $200 million marketing it. And of course, we're at a different scale when we're independent filmmakers, especially with documentaries. But you know, if you could raise the money to buy that fancy camera and travel around and make that documentary, raise that same amount of money so that you have that in your pocket so you can go and do all this all this uh, elbow grease, because if you're doing all that elbow grease, you gotta earn some money somewhere. You know, you still gotta eat. So 
make sure you can actually put some um, some of your investment towards your distribution campaign. And what we're what we're doing at Seed and Spark by building in this whole distribution pipeline is to make sure that filmmakers know up front what the costs, the deliverables costs are, so that they're able to add them to their crowdfunding campaign specifically. Um, and so that they're not surprised in the end, like, oh my God, it costs $2,000 to deliver my film to all these platforms, which by the way, is a song. Um, but you know, when you're an independent filmmaker and you've spent your last dime making your film because that's as far as you thought you had to get it, that can seem like a really terrible cost until you think about how well you could monetize your film if it were up on all the digital platforms and your audience knew it was there, right? Yeah, if you so, don't think you can make $2,000 back, then right. you... Don't, don't make your film. Uh, actually, that's fine. Um, but what, what, one of the things that we've built into the platform at Seed and Spark is staged financing, because what we're seeing a lot of filmmakers do is it's really hard to raise enough money to make a film. To raise enough money to, ra to make and market a film all at once is a very, very intimidating amount of money to raise usually. It takes a lot to raise six figures on it with crowdfunding. You know what I mean? If you haven't done it a bunch of times or you don't have a hired gun, um, most people, particularly starting out, don't have the, the community building expertise or they probably haven't done um, as much uh, audience building in advance to raise sort of six figures. So one is, y'all film students, start now. Start building your email lists now. Start getting those phone numbers now. Start getting, you know, uh, the locations of, of where all your people are now. I'm serious. I'm really serious. Um, <clears throat> and then um, they'll, they'll raise a certain amount for production. They'll get through production. They'll get maybe part of the way through post. And then we see people coming back to raise again for uh, festivals and distribution. Right, And so they're smaller individual campaigns, but it's also really cool to come back mm -hmm. and drive a ton of audience engagement right before you're about to take it out to all the digital platforms. So crowdfunding is really cool because it's one of the first times you actually like make it. money marketing <laughs> as opposed to spend money marketing. Right, That's the big, that's the big um, disruption of, that crowdfunding brought to, uh, to filmmaking in this case. So um, I think... That also will help you in this. Oh. Oh, sorry, I that was supposed to be covert. <laughs> that we are, we are at 10 a.m. Thank you so much. I think we'll all be here for a little bit to answer questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.